So our theme for this year is, is live generously. And during the month of January, we've, uh, we've kind of talked about that and uh, tried to, uh, to explain that in a variety of ways. And we saw, first of all, that living generously means that we must be united. There is going to come a time in our life this year and next year when we need each other and we must be united. And by the way, Jesus prayed that we would be united. He prayed that we would be one. We saw the importance of being humble, demonstrating humility, and Paul described it this way, count others as more significant than yourself. Treat everybody else as if they're more important than you are. We talked about our mission and the fact that um, as believers, we're not just on duty on Sunday mornings when we come to church, but we're on duty 24-7, and so in our home, in our neighborhood, in our workplace, we should be living out the truth of the gospel, looking for opportunities to point people to Jesus. And last week, we talked, uh, had a family conversation and talked about our vision as we strive to reach our community, what that means, how we want to be a, a multicultural, multi-generational church that is, that is transforming our community with the power of the gospel. If you missed any of those messages, I'd encourage you to go to our website and uh, you can watch them and listen to them again. But, but this idea of living generously should pervade every area of our lives including our family and including our marriages. So, so here at HCC, we are, we are really burdened this year about the fact of having families, having strong marriages that truly illustrate and represent the gospel. So we want you to know that our, our goal, our prayer is we pray for you. Our goal is for you to have a flourishing, fun, and faith-filled marriage. And so we're going we're gonna to take the month of February and we're going we're gonna to talk about that. We're going to talk about four different things. We're going to talk about covenant, commitment, communication, and contentment during the month of February. But let me give a couple of disclaimers before I start, because I know some of you have already thought a couple of things. And so let me give a couple of disclaimers. First of all, our goal in this series is not to beat you up or make you feel guilty for past mistakes. Whenever we go through a series like that, I know there's people in our congregation that, that, that have gone through a failed marriage before. You've gone through a difficult divorce, and our goal in this is not to beat you up. It's not to make you walk away feeling like an absolute failure. Today, we are thankful and we rest in the grace of God, the fact that God always gives us another chance. And so today, as we talk about marriage, we're not talking about your past. We're talking about your future. And we want you from this point forward to have relationships that truly honor and glorify him. The second thing I would say is this. This series is for singles too. Because <laughs> you might be single out there thinking, oh my word, a whole month on marriage. I'm probably going to have to find another church to go to for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> we don't want you to think that way. This series is for you too. First of all, let me say this. If you're single, praise God that you're single. Because God, what, what? <laughs> well, some of you don't agree with me on that, all right? Uh, praise God, at least for the moment. God has you right where he wants you. And so, praise God, in one of our messages, our last message, we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about, if you're single, being content right where God has you for the moment. But I would also say this series is going to be relevant to you because it's going to allow you, whether you're an older single or whether you're a teenager today, this is going to allow you to understand what the Bible says about marriage and to learn what type of spouse you will need to give you a gospel-centered marriage. And so don't discount it as if it doesn't apply to you. But even more importantly, I would say that marriage, I think, is one of the most beautiful pictures of the gospel. And our purpose in this series is not just to talk about marriage. It's not just to help you out in your marriage. And we pray and we have been praying that God does all of that. But we want you to learn about Jesus Christ. And we want you to realize, just as Stephen and the praise team just sang, that just as a husband pursues his wife, there's a God in heaven who is passionately pursuing you. 
and he desires to have an intimate relationship with you. And that's illustrated in marriage. The third disclaimer I'd give very simply is this. Vicki and I don't have a perfect marriage. It's close, isn't it, Vicki? <laughs> Does anybody do marital counseling? We could... Uh, close to being married 34 years. We've had, had a great marriage. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. I joke all the time. I don't know whether she's ever heard me say this joke before, so I'm a little nervous about saying it, but, uh, but we love each other every day. There's days that we struggle liking each other, all right? Probably her liking me more than me liking her, all right? Here's what I'm saying. None of us have figured it out. Marriage is a process. We're all learning. And so today, whether you've been married 34 years, or whether you're getting married in a few months, whether you hope to be married in the future, or maybe you say, I've already been there, done that, got the t-shirt, don't think I'm gonna do it again. It doesn't matter, the series is for you. So can we begin today with a word of prayer? And I want you to know, we have been praying and saturating this series in prayer. I believe with all of my heart that God is going to use this in the hearts of our people. So, so, so as I pray, would you pray that the Holy Spirit convicts you? Would you pray that the Holy Spirit motivates you and teaches you to live out the truth of the gospel in your home? Let's pray together today. Lord, today we're we're cognizant of our need for you. Where would I be without Jesus? I'm so grateful for your grace. I'm so grateful for your forgiveness in my life. Thank you that you haven't given up on me. I thank you for a wife who hasn't given up on me. So God, I pray that as we look at these truths today, help us to understand them. Help us to apply them to our lives. And Lord, wherever we are, Father, whether our, our marriage desperately needs restored or whether we just need a tune-up, whether we just need to be reminded and re-energized to live out the gospel, wherever we are, we pray today that the Holy Spirit of God would take the word of God and drive these truths home afresh and anew to our hearts and to our minds. We thank you for what you're going to do, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My first statement today is incredibly obvious, and yet it needs to be clarified. If you're following in your notes, the very first thing that I simply said is this, marriage is in crisis. Marriage is in crisis, both nationally, globally, locally, <laughs> and congregationally. Marriage is in crisis. That statement could be extrapolated and explained in a variety of ways. I just want to say two things about it, and I don't want to get too deep in it. But the first is this. Every measurable statistic shows that marriage in our country is at an all-time low in the United States of America. Let me give you a couple of statistics up here, and they might not mean anything to you. But in 2018, there'll be 67 marriages or weddings for every thousand adults. You sit back and say, what in the world does that mean? Well, that number is going down dramatically. In 1984, there were 10.6 marriages per every thousand adults. In 1946, there were 16.4 marriages for every 1,000 adults. Very simply, fewer and fewer people are getting married. 50% of the adults in our country are married today. You say, Brian, what does that mean? That is the lowest recorded number in U.S. history. Only 50% of the adults in our country are married. The number of adults living together before marriage instead of marriage is escalating. It's grown by 29% in the last 10 years. I, I could throw out more statistics. I've read more statistics in the last couple of days, and I don't want to bore you with them. The one statistic that's amazing is that the divorce rate is actually going down. 
It's not going up. Now, the interesting fact of that, sociologists have sat back and wondered why the divorce rate is going down, and it makes sense if the marriage rate is going down and there's less and less people getting married, then obviously the divorce rate is going down as well. But what is more frightening than those statistics, and those are just numbers, that's all they are, and you know what they say about statistics? 50% of all statistics are made up, right? Including the one I just quoted to you right there. So, 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 so statistics are just statistics. But what's even more frightening, though, is that there is a huge gap today between the biblical view of marriage and the human view of marriage. That, 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 that sounds very, very, very sociological. Let me just say it this way. There's a huge gap between what the Bible says about marriage and what we think about marriage. As a matter of fact, most of us here today would claim to be believers. Most of us here today would claim to be Bible believers. And yet I submit to you today that for many believers today, their view of marriage is different than what the Bible says about marriage. The world has completely changed what marriage is. Let me give you a couple of ridiculous illustrations, okay? Amanda Liberty, she's a British citizen. Amanda recently got engaged, I think we have her picture, recently got engaged to a chandelier. (laughs) I am not making this up, Google it. Amanda Liberty fell in love with the chandelier and got engaged to the chandelier. She stated, these are her words, last Valentine's Day, I proposed to her. She calls her chandelier Lumiere. I proposed to Lumiere to signify our long-lasting love. Obviously, she's, really, she's received a lot of criticism, and she said, hey, I'm not hurting anyone by entering into this relationship. I'm just following my heart. It gets much weirder than that. You can read the Google article later. Victor Aguilar, a mayor in the country of Mexico, took a crocodile to be his wife. There's the picture. The crocodile was baptized, put on a white dress, and they supposedly exchanged marriage vows. Now, in case you're wondering, the jaws were clamped shut so he could give her a kiss, all right? I just want you to know that, all right? Laura Messi, a 40-year-old Italian, you probably read about this, married herself in a ceremony that included a white dress, a three-layer cake, And she invited 70 of her closest friends to her marriage ceremony when she married herself. She said, these are her words, I firmly believe that each of us must first of all fall in love with ourselves. You can have a fairy tale wedding even without a prince. By the way, she's part of a growing trend, a quickly growing trend that dubs itself sologamy instead of monogamy, sologamy in countries around the world. Proponents of such ceremonies say that it's about self-love and acceptance. Now, I get it. Those are crazy examples. I doubt anybody here has a light fixture at home that you're in love with and you're, and you're thinking about marrying it or you have a pet that you're thinking about marrying and, and even though you probably really love yourself, I doubt that there's anybody here that's thinking about marrying himself or herself. But here's what I want you to get today. Our society has completely changed the definition of marriage. We've altered it from being permanent to be an escapable. (laughs) Gotta have an escape hatch, gotta have an escape clause in case it doesn't work. We've redefined who the participants are. We have even discounted its necessity, saying that marriage is no longer necessary. Jordan Johnson, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist in Salt Lake City said this, With the increasing societal acceptance of cohabitation, out-of-wedlock births, and single parenting, the institution of marriage has become less of a prerequisite and more of an option. This is somebody who's giving marital advice, marital counseling to people in 
our country. Here's what I'm saying today as we begin this series. For some reason, we have taken it upon ourselves to change the definition of marriage. The biblical view doesn't match our view. So, so what does the Bible say about marriage? Let me give you the biblical view. I'm going to lay it out right from the very beginning, okay? Here's the biblical view of marriage. Marriage is a lifelong, monogamous relationship between a man and a woman. We'll prove that from Scripture today. Marriage is a lifelong, monogamous relationship between a man and a woman. You might say, Brian, that definition is not politically correct. I know, but it's biblically correct. That definition is countercultural. That definition might go against what you think and what you believe, and if that's the case, that's fine. And by the way, let, let me just say, any person, regardless of their orientation, regardless of their relationship, is welcome at Hollywood Community Church, and we're going to love them, and we're going to embrace them, and we are going to care for them. But it's my job to teach what the Bible says. It's our job to teach what the Bible says. And we're going to do it in a loving way. And so, in, in, in God's view, marriage is not an experiment. Marriage is not a contract. Marriage is not a lifestyle. The, none of those are words that the Bible uses to describe marriage. They're words that we use, but they're not words that God uses. And so let me give you a word that the Bible uses talking about marriage today. It's the second point in your outline. Marriage is a covenant. Marriage is a covenant. Now, now, now let's just lay, lay the context for all of this. The Bible is filled with covenants. God speaks of covenants all throughout Scripture. In Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 15, God made a covenant with Abraham. Remember he told Abraham, man, look to the stars, count the stars, and you know what, man, I'm going to make your descendants as great as the stars. And God made a promise. He made a covenant with Abraham. When, when Moses went up Mount Sinai and, and he received the Ten Commandments, uh, God, God made a covenant. It's called the Mosaic Covenant. God made a covenant with the nation of Israel. In the New Testament, you and I have been given a new covenant, a covenant of grace that has been sealed and ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Today, as a follower of Jesus, I don't have to worry about whether I'm, uh, I'm ever going to disappoint God, whether he's going to kick me out of his family, whether he's going to decide that he's tired of me. I don't have to worry about that. I am a child of God for all of eternity, not because of who I am or what I've done, but because of what Jesus has done for me. That is a new covenant, a new pact that God has given to us that is sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so the Bible is all about covenants. Well, it's interesting because the Bible uses that exact same word talking about marriage. And so look at this verse, and we're going to dive into a text in just a second. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 14. Let, let me put all of this in context. So the Israelite men were being unfaithful to their wives Matter of fact, they were, they were divorcing their older wives and they were marrying younger foreign women. And as a result of that, God looks at them and says, I'm not going to accept your offerings anymore. And, and this is the response. But you say, why does he not? God, why are you not accepting our offerings? Malachi says, because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion, notice the next phrase, and your wife by, read the next word with me, covenant. covenant. And so God tells these men that the lady that you married is your wife by covenant. The Hebrew word beret, the exact same word that is used to describe the Abrahamic covenant, the exact same Hebrew word that is used to describe the Mosaic covenant, when God describes marriage, he said, here's what marriage is. It's a covenant. 
It's a covenant between a man and a woman. So I've defined covenant in your notes this way. A covenant is a solemn vow that one person makes to another with God as their witness. So, so, so simply, marriage vows are covenantal. I, I have the privilege of participating in a lot of weddings, and I have the privilege of participating in a lot of funerals, and I have the privilege of standing right up here at times with the husband and the wife and, and looking at them and saying, would you repeat the following vows in the sight of God and these witnesses? And then that, that bride and that groom make these vows to each other for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, richer or poorer, till death separates us, till death do us part. You know what that is? That is covenantal language. That's a, that's a man looking at the wife and saying, I want you to know I am not going anywhere. I know it's gonna get a lot more difficult than this, but I want you to know I am here and I am here to stay. I'm not going anywhere. And it's the lady looking at the husband saying, you know what, I know you're good looking now, but in 30 years you're not gonna look like you are. And I want you to know that I am here to stay. I am not going anywhere. And in the sight of God, we make these vows, one, two, another. Well, Genesis chapter 2, and if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, because Genesis chapter 2 is filled with what we call covenantal language. The word covenant is not found in it, but, but covenantal language is found throughout this chapter, and it's found specifically in the last verse where we're going to spend a little bit of time today. And so follow with me, Genesis chapter 2. I'm begin reading in verse 18. We'll put it up on the screen, and, and we'll pause and make some comments as we go. Verse 18, Genesis 2. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Now, let's pause there for a second. And remember, as God created everything, God looked at it and he said something. What did God say? He created the sun and he said, it's what? It's good. He created the moon and he said, what? It's good. He created the heavens and the earth and he said, it's good. He created the animals and he said, it's good. He created Adam and he said, it's good. But this is the first time in scripture where God looks at Adam and he sees that Adam is alone and it's the first time and God looks at Adam and he says, what? It's not good. This is not good. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Let me just pause because I'm going to say that I'm, I'm not crazy about the translation helper there. Because, uh, because the way that we've translated has the idea that God has put this woman in my life to assist me. She's my assistant. She's my servant. Vicky, bring me a glass of tea. <laughs> I hope supper's ready at six o'clock. You're my helper, all right? Remember what your job description is. That's who you are. That's not what the Hebrew word intends. Guys, if you use that at home, put that in your pocket and never use it again. That's not what the passage means. The word helper in the passage simply means, all right, he needed a partner is what it means. It means that he needed someone like him. The Hebrew word means he needed somebody who corresponded to him. And that's what's actually explained in the rest of the passage. And so keep reading with me in verse nine. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave to all the livestock and to all the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. He did not find someone who corresponded to him. 
So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. So, so, so here's what's happening. All of this, this isn't, this isn't by accident that all of this is happening at, at this time. God looks down at Adam, and Adam to a certain degree is alone, and God says, man, it's not good that Adam should be alone. And so God says, hey, I got an idea, Adam. I want you to name the animals. And so God, God brings the animals to Adam, and one by one, he names them elephant, lion, tiger, hippopotamus. You ever wonder why he named that? I know that wasn't the word. He's in Hebrew or something. But anyway, so he's naming the animals. But while he's naming the animals, Adam's thinking. The animals come by, and he's saying, not like me. Not like me. Not like me. Boy, that's a weird looking animal. I'm glad that's not like me. Not like me. And he goes through all of the animals, and Adam realizes there was nobody like him. So while he's naming the animals, or at the end of naming the animals, God causes a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And you know the story while he's sleeping, God takes one of his ribs and God forms Adam. And Adam. God wakes Adam up, and Adam wakes up, and he looks at Eve. This is Brian's translation, and he says, like me. God has created someone just like me. Read the next verse. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from man. The Hebrew word for man is ish. The Hebrew word from, for, for woman is isha. She has come from man. And Adam says, finally, God, you made someone who corresponds to me. Someone who's rational, someone who has intellect, someone who can think, someone who is my equal. And she named, or he names her woman, Isha, Eve, because she came from him. And then God makes the first statement of marriage in Scripture. Verse 24, God says this. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So, so here's what I want you to catch. If you're following along in your notes, there's, there's three truths that we pull from that that teach us what God thinks of marriage and demonstrate that marriage is a covenant Quickly, the first one is this. You and your spouse are joined together by God. You and your spouse are joined together by God. The idea in the passage is clear. God made one man and one woman. God didn't, when all of a sudden Adam was asleep, say, you know what, I'm gonna give him a hundred different women and let him choose. Could you imagine how shocked Adam would have been? He woke up and there's a hundred women right there. I'm sure it was a big enough shop waking up and seeing one right there. No, but, but God brings one woman to one man. <laughs> we jokingly say that Adam could legitimately look at Eve and say, you were the only woman in the world for me. <laughs> because she was. But that's a truth. Because just as God joined Adam and Eve together, if you're married today, God has joined you together. Matter of fact, husbands, do me a favor. Look at your wives right now and tell her, you're the only woman in the world for me. Would you do that right now, guys? Come on, don't be shy, do it. You are the only woman in the world for me. God brought Adam and Eve together. God has brought you together. There's a second truth that we see in the passage You and your wife are not only brought together or joined together by God, but you and your spouse are glued together by God. Say, Brian, what in the world are you talking about? 
Verse 24. Can we go back to verse 24? I'm not sure whether we can go back to verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall hold fast to his wife. If you have an older translation, a King James translation, it says, shall cleave to his wife. That, that word is a really interesting word. That word cleave or that word hold fast um, later in Scripture is translated glue or cement. Same root, same root. And, and so here's what, here's, what, here's what God said, man, I've, Adam, I brought this lady to you. I've not only joined you together, but I am gluing you together. That's what the Hebrew word means. I am cementing you together. I am gluing you together. Let, let, let me ask you, just by way of thinking, what happens when you try to pull apart two things that have been glued together? Are they joined together? It what? It tears them. It destroys them. Why is that? Because that glue was meant to be what? That glue was meant to be permanent. Man, man, man. What happens in families when we separate what God has glued together? What happens? There's damage. There's damage that occurs. Man, I, I wish, I can't obviously for confidentiality, but I wish you could sit with, with me and, and our pastors as we give marital counseling to couples and you could see the damage that is done and the pain that is done and the hurt that is created when two people try to pull apart what God has glued together. God, God uses the word glue. Let me show you a third thing. The third thing is this, you and your spouse are one flesh. That's what he says in the passage, and he said, and they shall become one flesh. The perfect illustration of this are our children. Our children are the union of what? Both of us. You ever look at a baby and say, boy, he's got dad's eyes, but he's got mom's mouth, huh? Or his right foot is like dad and his left foot is like mom. I don't know. I mean, but I mean, uh, I mean, you look at this child and you say, oh my word, this is what? This is a mixture of these two people in human flesh. That's what Jesus says. Or, or God says and later Jesus says. That, that, that when God joins a man and a woman together, they shall become one flesh. So here's the principle I want you to catch. Put this in your head. Put this in your heart. Uh, believe it. Hold on to it. When your marriage, when you entered into your marriage, whether wisely or foolishly, whether sincerely or insincerely, whether selfishly or unselfishly, when you entered into your marriage, God's design, God's plan for your marriage is that it would be permanent. To destroy a marriage is to destroy a creation of God. Not my words, Jesus' words. Look with me how Jesus fleshed this out in Matthew chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Jesus repeats Genesis 2.24 and says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Identical to Genesis 2.24. Then Jesus says, So that they are no longer two, but they are one flesh. Then he says this, What therefore God has joined together, let no one separate. Why would we not separate them? Because God has joined them together. Man, as we, as we start this four-week series, that this is so foundational. I want you to catch this. When you accept that divorce is not an option, now I get in the majority of cases, I understand that there's abuse sometimes, I get all of that, and, and obviously we work through those, but when you accept that divorce is not an option, and you accept that there is nowhere else to go, your view of marriage completely changes. It completely changes. Knowing that you can't get out of it is the key to your marriage being transformed. Let me say that again. Knowing that you cannot get out of it is the key 
to your marriage being transformed. Why is that? Because it's at that moment that you really commit to working on your marriage and following God's blueprints. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, but Brian, you don't know my husband. <laughs> he, he, he just aggravates the living daylights out of me. I just, I, I can't even stand to look at him at times. How am I going to stay married to this guy if I can't stand to look at him at times? Or you might sit back, guys, and say, Brian, you have no idea the woman that I'm living with. You know how the Bible talks about a woman that's like, you know, a constant drip? That's my wife. She's a drip. Drip, 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 drip. That's my life. That's our dinner conversation. That's everything over and over and over and over again. I get it. I hear it all the time. But God brought you together. And if God can bring you together, God can restore, God can renew, and God can re-energize your marriage. And let me just say from experience, it's at that moment that you begin to see God do something that only God can do. Marriage is a covenant. It's a covenant witnessed by God, by two people that love each other. Uh, I want to show you a second thing, and I want to illustrate something for you today. So, so the second thing is that marriage is not just a covenant. Marriage is a canvas. I'm going to paint something for you today, all right? Now, you might sit back and say, Brian, come on. You're not a painter. I am a painter. I am a painter. As a matter of fact, I want to show you a painting that I painted. Look at this. That is my painting right there. Isn't that, aren't you impressed? Thinking nobody's impressed. I, I really thought they would be impressed with that. I was, at a, I was at a pastor's retreat, and they paid for all of us pastors to take a painting class. And this is the, this is the, this is the thing that I painted. And actually, it, it's special, so that's this to put a personal touch on it. And so if you'll notice, right over here in the tree, I've carved out Vicky's initials, VB, right over there in the tree. And I came back from this pastor's retreat, and I gave this picture to Vicky. She, she was so impressed with it, she hung it in our bathroom. <laughs> now, <laughs> you, know, you know the part of the house where nobody else goes? Nobody else goes? And it's not only just in the main part of the bathroom, it's clear back in the little part of the bathroom, you know where the toilet is, that only, only you go in all by yourself. That's where this picture hangs all the time on a regular basis. Now, she has a reason for that. She said, Brian, that's because it's relaxing and it helps us to relax. I'm not sure whether you can, you can interpret that any way that you want. But here's what I want you to catch today. I want you to catch that, that your marriage and my marriage is a canvas. It's a canvas in which God desires to paint something beautiful on. Stephen and the praise team alluded to it just a little bit ago, and I think they're going to sing the song at the conclusion of the service. But I, I want you to catch this, that God designed marriage as a picture of his romantic pursuit of us. Think about that. Ma marriage just isn't two people who think each other are pretty coming together and saying, you know what, I think we could live the rest of our lives together. It's not just two people who are alike coming together, because if that's the case, God would have never brought Vicki and I together. She loves being outside. I don't like being outside. Mosquitoes are drawn to me. And so, and so it's funny that th th this is... You're going to think bad of me, so we have a fire pit outside, and Vicki goes out there, especially during this time of year, and loves spending time in the fire pit, and there's a lot of nights that she's outside in the fire pit, and I'm on the inside because I don't want to get bitten by mosquitoes, and she has six chairs around the fire pit, and she has to imagine the rest of her family there because Brian's not outside with her. Yeah, I know. That's pretty bad, isn't it? That's pretty bad, huh? I told you, I told you, we're not a perfect marriage, right? We're working on it. We're working on it. Listen, marriage is not, it's not two perfect people coming together. But marriage in a real sense is a picture of the fact 
that God is pursuing and God is chasing after you. And, and, and in a real way, this is so good because God sat back, I think, and sat back and thought, boy, how could I illustrate marriage? And, and obviously to talk about you know, the conversations of the Trinity and everything is something so mysterious. But I kind of imagine God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. If this sounds blasphemous, please forgive me. I don't mean it to be, but I imagine the conversation. And so the three of them sitting back before we were ever created and thinking, boy, how can we illustrate the love that we have for the people that we are going to create? And, and God the Father, God the Son says, why don't we create marriage and have a man pursue and chase after a woman. And let that be a picture of us chasing after them. That's just the way I view it. You're not going to find that in the Bible anywhere. But, but, but you are going to find the simple fact that God is chasing after you. <laughs> Here, let me say it this way because I can't paint and talk at the same time. All right? God longing to paint on the canvas of creation his love, his pursuit, his zeal for us, puts it in the heart of man to pursue a woman. Marriage is a beautiful illustration of God's great love for us. Just as a husband pursues his wife, so God is pursuing you. So, so, so here's what I want you to catch. Do you like that, by the way? Isn't that pretty good? So, so here is, I'm going to explain it in just a second. So here's the cross on a hillside with a heart. And if you can't see, there's a B for Brian and there's a V for Vicky, Vicky right in there. Vicky, I'll give this to you afterward, all right? <laughs> you, can, you can put it in our gallery that's called our bathroom. You can put it there, all right? <laughs> here's the way Paul defined it. In Ephesians chapter 5, he said, Husbands, love your wives. How? As Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And so, men, as husbands, we have been challenged to love our wives just as Jesus loves the church. <laughs> with all the patience that he demonstrates with us, with all the opportunities that he gives us day after day and time after time. That's what marriage is. And when God designed marriage, he didn't just say, okay, you know what, we gotta create a vehicle through which people are gonna be born and people are gonna be populated, so let's create this thing called marriage. No, God had a far greater design in it. And when God brought you and your wife together, his purpose, his design, catch this church, please catch this. When God brought you and your wife together, his purpose, his design was that you would be a reflection of the gospel. You might sit back today and say, wow, <laughs> I'm sure glad we're not being filmed 24 seven at our house. Hey, I'm glad we're not being filmed 24 seven at our house either. God desires for your marriage to be a canvas through which the truth of the gospel can be lived out. Let me just say this today. I'm up here, so I get a chance to say it. I thank God for my wife. Vicki is an incredibly talented and beautiful woman. I still can't believe that she chose me I mean, seriously, I'm kind, kind of a, I wouldn't say ugly, but a kind of a nor normal run-of-the-mill guy. It's funny, sometimes the pastors get together and they talk about, yeah, as a pastor, you got to be careful because, you know, l ladies look up to and you got to be real careful. And I look at the other pastors and say, no lady's ever made any move towards me whatsoever. That's <laughs> never happened to me. I mean, <laughs> I'm just kind of blah, you know, that's just who I am. But, but guess what? Guess what? She thinks I'm cute. <laughs> she thinks I'm cute. Don't tell her any different. Don't tell her any different. She thinks I'm cute. She's come alongside of me. And I've come alongside of her. We have been given a mission by God. 
we take that mission so very important. Here's our mission, to make much of Jesus. Our mission is to live, to love, to, to raise our kids in such a way that when people look at us, they don't see all of Brian's idiosyncrasies. And Vicki can talk to you for hours about my idiosyncrasies. They don't see that. They don't look at him and say, how in the world did he end up with her? All right, you, 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 you've probably seen couples that way. That's not what we want people to see. We want people to look at our marriage. And guess what? See Jesus in our marriage. Two people who aren't perfect, two people who are flawed, but two people who are able to come together by the grace of God and reflect the truth of the gospel in our lives each and every day. Do we do it every day? No, we don't do it every day. Does Vicki do it better than me? Probably does so. She probably does, but that's our purpose, to make much of Jesus and to create an environment in which children might flourish and grow into the fullness of what God wants them to be. That's our task. That's our goal that God has been given to us, that God has given to us. And in the meantime, he's made us incredibly happy. And I trust however many more years that God gives us that we are able to spend those years together. We want our marriage to reflect the gospel. Simple question, I'm done. I'm done today. Let me ask you today, what does your marriage reflect? Because, because your marriage is also on a canvas. Your marriage is also painting a picture today. And your kids are seeing that picture. Your in-laws are seeing that picture. Your neighbors are seeing that picture. Whether you realize it enough, your marriage is a canvas that God desires to draw on. But sadly, we have a tendency to kind of take the brush awake from him, and we create our own painting, and we mar it, and we mess it up. And there's times that we just got to say, okay, God, I'm going to give the brush back to you. I'm going to give the brush back to you. And God in his grace is able to take that canvas that we've messed up, and God is able to make something beautiful out of it in and through Jesus Christ. So, so church family today, here's our purpose. Our purpose, yes, we want to restore. We want to renew. We want to re-energize marriages. But is there a better testimony in our community today than a family who loves Jesus, who loves each other, and lives out the truth of the gospel. May God make our family that. May God make your family that. But it starts with a covenant.